Bibles. Let's turn to John 17. I want to share with you from God's Word. John 17. As you've been reading, I mean, as, as you're turning, let me start sharing a few things with you. Recently, I've been looking and spending a lot of time reading and thinking about how Jesus and Paul ended their ministry. Alright? The best disciple makers ever known to man, Jesus and Paul, and we are given this gift of seeing into how they finished their ministry. How they trained. We read this morning in the scripture reading from 2 Timothy 2. You know 2 Timothy is the last book Paul wrote. It's his passing the baton to Timothy. And we see Paul telling Timothy what to do. Today in John 17, we're seeing the final prayer of Jesus before his crucifixion with the disciples. The final time with the disciples. And what, we know, what I noticed is, at the end of their life, guess what they're doing? They're equipping their disciples to continue the work without them. Right? Makes sense? They're giving them the most needful things, and I'm trying to pull this into my own life. And so, it's been really nice this week studying this passage, and just sitting in this passage. I don't often get to drink, so when I'm in the Bible, it gives me a reason this week just to be doing this. Let me give you a little bit of context. John 17 is the end of the Passover meal. We call it the Lord's Supper. You know, the picture, Leonardo, I think they painted, of all the disciples. This is the end of it. John devotes four chapters to this one event, the Passover meal. In 13, John 13, he starts with Jesus doing something radical. The leader, the teacher, bends down and washes the feet of his disciples. And then he tells them, Judas is going to be traded. Now think about that. These men have been walking him together for three years, following Jesus, and he says, someone at one is going to be trained. And then, once Judas left, remember, Judas has left the time. Instead of this in it, finishing the Lord, the, the supper, Jesus started teaching and giving his last commands to his disciples. He told them that he would be leaving them soon. Chapter 14, he comforts them by telling them, even though I'm going, I'm, there, I'm going to prepare a place that one day you will come. And you'll be with me. I'm not going to leave you alone. In John 14, he also tells them, you're going to do greater things than I've done. John 14, 12. Remember that verse? Those who come after me will do the things I've been doing. They will do even greater things than these. He promises them the Holy Spirit. I will not leave you orphans. I'm going to send you the Spirit. Who are you to do what I've started? In John 15, he teaches them how to be effective. I love John 15. For some of us, it's maybe our favorite chapter in the whole Bible. He tells them how to be effective. What does he tell them? He says, you want to bear much fruit? You must abide in me. And I in you. Because you can do nothing apart from me. And it's, God, Jesus is so plain. <clears throat> and we're so dense, we think we can do it all without him. But he tells them, you can do nothing <coughs> apart from me. He then prepares them in 16, then the 15 and 16, for persecution that's going to come. He says, the world's hated me, they're going to hate you too. But he assures them, I have overcome the world. <coughs> you see what he's doing? He's preparing them for the next two, three, four, or five months when they're going to have to do it without him. We're getting to that place sometimes with our oldest, Elijah. He's turning 15 in a week, a week or two. And we're starting to think, okay, we've got four more years of Elijah with us, but really we're preparing him to go out into the world without us. And Jesus, knowing his time on earth was really close, was then to, to ending. He's preparing his disciples. And then he comes into 17 and he breaks into prayer. And I want us to read that prayer. John 17, verse 1. 
When Jesus had spoken these words, he lifted up his eyes to heaven and he said, Father, the hour has come. Glorify your Son that the Son may glorify you. Since you have given him authority over all flesh to give eternal life to all whom you have given him. And this is eternal life, that they know you, the only true God, and Jesus, whom you have sent. I have glorified you on earth, having accomplished the work that you gave me to do. That's a powerful verse. Do you want to glorify the Lord? Complete the work He's given you. Verse 5. And now, Father, glorify me in your own presence with the glory that I had with you before the world existed. We can stop and just talk about it. Jesus laid down His glory for us. And now He's getting ready to go back to the Father and receive the glory He always had before He came to I have manifested your name to the people whom you, who you gave me out of the world. Yours they were, and you gave them to me, and they have kept your word. Now, they know that everything that you have given me is from you. For I have given them the words that you gave me, and they have received them. They have come to know in truth that I came from you, and they have believed that you sent me. I am praying for them. He's praying for his disciples. Now. I am not praying for the world, but for those whom you have given me, for they are yours. All mine are yours, and yours are mine, and I am glorified in them. And I am no longer in the world, but they are in the world, and I am coming to you, Holy Father. Keep them in your name, which you have given me, that they may be one, even as we are one. While I was with them, I kept them in your name, which you have given me. I have guarded them, and not one of them has been lost except the son of destruction, that's Judas that the scripture might be fulfilled. But now I am coming to you, and these things I speak in the world, that they may have my joy fulfilled in themselves. Isn't that awesome? Jesus gives his joy in us. I have given them your word, and the world has hated them, because they are not of the world, just as I am not of the world. I do not ask that you take them out of the world, but that you keep them from the evil. They are not of the world, just as I am out of the world. Sanctify them in the truth. Your word is truth. Sanctify me, set apart. As you sent me into the world, so I have sent them into the world. And for their sake, I consecrate or sanctify myself, that they also may be sanctified in truth. Then he's going to pray for us. This is Jesus' prayer for us. I do not ask for these only, but also for those who will believe in me through their word. That they may all be one. This is Jesus' prayer for us. Just as you, Father, are in me, and I in you. That they also may be in us, so that the world may believe that you have sent me. The glory that you have given me, I have given to them. That they may be one, even as we are one. I in them and you and me, that they may become perfectly one, so that the world may know that you sent me. So the second time. So the world may know that you sent me, and love them even as you love me. Father, I desire that they also whom you have given me may be with me where I am, to see my glory that you have given me, because you love me before the foundation of the world. O oh, righteous Father, even though the world does not know you, I know you. And these know you, that you know that you have sent me. I made known to them your name, and I will continue to make it known that the love with which you have loved me may be in them, and I in them. Pray with me. Dear Jesus, we pray, even as we look at this passage, that you would bring the truth you want to reveal. God, there's so much here. But Lord, you teach us what you want us to know. You help me get out of the way. You let your words speak in Christ's name. Amen. Amen. We could spend weeks, we could do a whole sermon series on this one part. Today, though, I just want us to pull a few things out that are highlights and lessons for us, Jesus' disciples. Now, some people call this Jesus' high priestly prayer. 
And those of you who have been believers for a while, you know your Bible, know that in the Old Testament, the high priest would go into the Holy of Holies and make intercession for the people of Israel. This is Jesus praying for His disciples and for us, those who believe because of their message. I want to look at a few, few just nuggets we can pull out of this as a disciple. Lessons for the disciple. The first lesson when I've been studying the scripture is we need a deep love for the Father. Did you pick up on that in Jesus' prayer? Jesus knew the Father. It was as comfortable as breathing for Jesus to talk to the Father. There was this deep, confident relationship with his Father. It feels like when we read this prayer that we're being gifted to look on something that's sacred, something that's intimate, a sacred unity, a closeness that we often don't see when people refer to God the Father. And the awesome part about this is Jesus invites us into that relationship. Look in verse 3. He tells us that eternal life is knowing God. Did you guys know that? Many of us think eternal life is fire insurance. We have eternal life so we go to heaven. Jesus said eternal life is so much more than that. Eternal life. Do you see this? This is eternal life. That they know you. And I don't mean know like we know about the George Washington. To know intimately God. The gift he gives of himself to let himself be known. Jesus invites us into that relationship. You know, when... Sarah and I had our first child, Elijah. He was a baby, I remember. He would cry. And Sarah would go, hmm, he's hungry. And then he would cry again sometimes later or something. She would say, oh, he needs change. And sometimes he would cry and she would say, yeah, he's frustrated. And sometimes he would cry and she would just sit there for a while. And she'd go, yeah, that's not an emergency cry. You guys know. Anyone there's had children. How did she know all those different cries? He didn't say one word. And yet, she knew all the needs he had. She knew because she was with him every moment and every day. She knew the cries he made. <coughs> Jesus prays to the Father. But the intimacy, the closeness he has with the Father didn't come by a casual relationship with the Father. The closeness Jesus had with the Father came from eternity past, where he had spent every moment of every waking hour, every moment, even before time existed with the Father. And he calls us into a relationship with a relationship like that, that we know the Father. Did you hear? There's no formalities when Jesus prays. He doesn't pray with a nice Christian voice, Oh, thou Father. He calls out to the Father. He's going into the most difficult point of his life on earth, knowing the crucifixion is coming. And what does he want to do? He wants to spend time with the Father. There's no fear. There's no trying to impress the Father. There's just closeness. You see, Jesus knew, He accepted that He was the beloved Son of the Father. You know, He offers us that same closeness. That same closeness of relationship with the Lord, but so often we don't take it. We instead choose to believe the lies of Satan. We think we're not worth it. We think God's not trustworthy. We think we didn't we weren't good enough this week to spend time with the Father. We sin and we run from the Father. Because we've got a skewed view of that relationship with the Lord. If you are in Christ, you are the beloved sons and the beloved daughters of God. Isaiah tells us that the Lord's eyes and his feet are, are watching. His ears are open to your cries. Do you remember that? It says, the Lord's eyes and his ears are watching the righteous. 
You know, when you cry out to God, He knows when you're hungry. He knows your cry from when you're afraid. He knows the cry from when you when you're frustrated. He knows even the cry that's not even a, really an emergency. He knows you. He's closer to us than the air we breathe, and yet so often we don't trust Him. We don't believe in He has our best interests. You know, we, at our house, we have this cat that we named Mew. Someone at our house named Mew. And my daughter Anna is trying to tame this feral cat. So, Mew shows up, Anna buys gourmet cat food, goes and gives Mew some cat food. You know, this cat doesn't trust us one bit. We love this cat. We, we provide way too much money on cat food for this cat. <laughs> we try on, thanks, or on Thanksgiving Day to invite the cat into the house and stay warm. But this cat will refuses to believe that we're safe. I often think if this cat would only let us hold her, she could experience the joy of being petted. If this cat would only let us bring her inside when it's cold, she could sleep warm at night. If this cat would only let us give her what we want to give her, her life would be so much better. And then I think, God's offering that to us. And so often we turn from Him and we stay sleeping in the cold, starving, because we refuse to run to the who has the ability to meet our needs. Or we run to something that's counterfeit. We run to the movies to check out. Or we run to this relationship or that job, trying to make enough money, trying to do it on our own. When all the while the Father's saying, come inside and sit with me. Come to me, you who are the heavy lady, and I will give you rest. We prefer God at a distance in our misery more than we prefer God close in relationship. Lesson for a disciple. If you've trusted Jesus, you're a disciple. It is you need a close relationship with the Father. And that relationship is built on time spent with the Father. Another part of that lesson would be that God's trustworthy. The one who knew the Father best, Jesus, fully trusted the Father. And if Jesus can trust God, the Father, we can trust the Father. Jesus teaches his disciples another lesson. He shows us how we should feel about those who are disciples. How we should feel about those the Father has given to us. Look with me with these verses. Jesus loves his disciples and he wants what's best for them. In verse 11 he says, he's praying for his disciples. He says, Father, keep them in your name which you have given me, that they may be one, even as we are one. In verse 12 he says, I have guarded those you gave me. <coughs> verse 14, I have given your word to those you gave me. Verse 19, for their sake I consecrate, or I make myself more holy and set apart so that they also will see my model and be sanctified. Jesus loved his disciples. And you know, his disciples were not a group of people that are very easy to love. Just before this whole scene, the disciples are arguing about who's going to be greatest. I'm going to be better. I'm going to be better. They're like children. This group had tax collectors. Matthew. This group had um, a Zionist. Someone who's fighting the rebel wars. Had people who were arguing and fighting. And then there's Peter who's always saying, I'm not going to answer, I'm not going to answer, I'm not going to answer. <laughs> and talking out of turn. I identify a lot with Peter because I always have to ask for them. Because you just think. But Jesus loved them. 
You know, everyone in this room has someone you're discipling, whether you know it or not. God has given you people to have influence over. How many of you are parents? Okay, good. Any teachers? Teachers. How many of you have people who you supervise? Here. How many of you have friends? <laughs> you keep your hand out on friends. I'm worried. <laughs> God has given you someone to decide. Jesus shows that's how you should feel and how you should act towards him. Jesus gave selfless love to his disciples. He teaches us a huge lesson in this passage. He starts off by this passage what? With his eyes focused on the Father, where his strength comes from. And then he moves to where his concern is. Those he's discipling. You see that? First part of this passage, he's saying, Father, Father, and he's talking about glorify me. And then he says, now I pray for those you've given me. Are you following his example? Are you praying for the people God's given you? Are you praying for your children? Are you praying for those God's given you? You know who they are. If I say, who are the people God's given you? I be your wife. I be your husband. I be your neighbor. Do you guard them? And this, I'm going to be truthful with you. I have not arrived when it comes to this, especially my family. Am I guarding my family so that they are protected from the evil one? Have you given your disciples, those God's given you, the Word of God so that they can know God and they can be sanctified in truth? How do we know that to be sanctified in truth? And Jesus says, your Word is truth. Are you yourself becoming more and more and more and more and more like Jesus so that those who follow you see that model and want to emulate you as you emulate Christ. Right? Isn't that what Paul said? Follow me and I'll follow Christ. Imitate me as I am Christ. Paul does, you see how this study said with Jesus and Paul. Paul does praise the same prayer basically when he says in Philippians 2.17 and if I'm being poured out as a drink offering, if I'm being completely consumed on your faith so that you'll thrive, I rejoice. Right? He tells the Philippians, God's going to complete the work He started in you. And if I'm being exhausted and burned up just for you, I rejoice. He loved His disciples. You know where Paul learned to care about his disciples? Who he learned it from? He primarily learned it from Barnabas, who discipled him. You know, one of the most powerful pe people in the whole book of Acts is probably Barnabas, who encouraged and unleashed great evangelists and church planters. And he himself, in the background, unleashed a movement. <clears throat> As a disciple, we're called the selfless, sacrificial love for those who give to God's given us. So, the lesson for us is to love those that God has given us. As well as we should believe in what God can do for them. It's one thing to love and make them dependent, and sometimes love becomes dependence, right? You need me, I'm just going to give you a little bit here and there. Jesus was equipping his disciples to go do the ministry. You see that? And he believed in them. In verse 17, he said, Sanctify them in truth. As you sent me into the world, I'm also sending them into the world. And then in verse 20, he's so confident that they're going to be successful. He says, I don't even just pray for them, but I'm going to pray for the people who are going to believe because of their word. You see that? Jesus believed his disciples were going to succeed. He was sending them into the world. He believed in them. They would see success. Guess what? We're the proof of their success. We are here because the disciples completed the task God gave. 
I've got a friend. He's one of my main mentors. His name is Bill Smith. And Bill has trained more missionaries than anyone I know. And many of them are leading huge, hundreds of thousands of people come to faith movements around the world. And Bill was talking with me one time and he said, Do you believe your disciples are those you pour your life into are going to do greater things than you are? And do you treat them with the respect that they're going to be the leaders of movements? Or do you treat them as if they are children and they need you all the time? You know, it's not healthy for a kid to grow up and turn 30 and still want to live at home and not work and stay with their family and be dependent on mom and dad, right? It's not healthy for someone to be a follower of Jesus for a long time and not be about the ministry of Jesus either. He said, Bill told me, he said, do you treat them with respect as who they are and who they're going to be because Jesus did. John 14, 12, Jesus tells us, you're going to do great things. So the lesson for us is build a deep relationship with the Father and develop a deep love for your disciples. Finally, Jesus tells us we need, the lesson for a disciple is we need deep love for the world. Verse 22 shares with us the why behind what Jesus did, why he did. It shows us why Jesus sacrificed himself for his disciples. Why he wanted them to have a deep love and a deep unity with the Father. Verse 22 is going to tell us that Jesus gave himself so that the world that hated him, the world that would hate his disciples, would know that God loved them. Do you hear me? Isn't that strange? Only in God's word. The world that would hate Jesus and crucify him, he's doing all this work so that that world would know that God loved them. In verse 22, verse 20, it says this, The glory you have given me, I have given them, or us, that they may be one, even as we are one. I and them, you and me. That they may become perfectly one. Why? So that the world may know that you sent me and love them, even as you love me. You know the God who lo knows you, the God who loves you, He wants to use you so that others will know how much He loves them. Do you hear that? Unity in the church isn't just so we all get along. Unity in the church is because by unity the world will know that Jesus was sent by God. And the world will know that Jesus loves them. That's something we can unify around. That God who loves us wants us to love the world so that the world knows that God loves them. We the church, listen to this, we, the church, are to first love God so much that we long for time with Him. Then we are to take Him at His word that He delights in us and be, be comfortable in the presence with intimacy with our Lord. Then we are to love each other in the same way that Jesus loves God and God loves Jesus. He's praying that for us. When we do this, the world will see the truth that Jesus is. You know everyone out here, outside this building, they're saying, is God real? You know the best testimony of God real or not? According to this passage, is the unity of We love God. We love each other. And through that, we love the Bible. This week, and I'll, this will be it, and I'll wrap up. Sarah and I were visiting with Russell. Um, Russell's his nickname. His real name is Revival Islam. But Russell's one of our missionaries here in New York. And he's a former Muslim from Bangladesh. And he's a great, effective evangelist and church planter. Russell came about six years ago. He had to flee Bangladesh because his family was trying to kill him three times. And left him for dead twice. And he fled and he came here. And, some, and he went to a Bangladeshi church right down the street here on Woodside Avenue. There was a Christian background church. And they said, you need to meet Brad because Brad loves Muslims. Because I've been out sharing Christ and Jackson Heights a lot with Muslims. I met Russell and Russell started going sharing with me. Russell, we've been praying for his family for years. Um, Russell just 
said the oath and got his whatever his citizenship here. And so the first thing he did was he booked a trip to go to Bangladesh, India and Bangladesh. He wasn't sure he was going to go into Bangladesh because he didn't know if it was too dangerous. He didn't know how he would be received. But he had this burning passion to share Christ again with his family. And his and so God told him, yeah, you can just go. You can go. And so he risked it. He went into Bangladesh. You know, we've been praying for his family for years. His wife, Anise, is also a former Muslim. She, he led her to faith. And then they got married. Her family has been coming to faith. Her brother, um, Ednin, trusted faith for his guy because Anise led him to faith for his guy when he was living in Poland for Malaysia. He's gone home, and Russell got to baptize him this time in Bangladesh. But this is the first time in five years he's gone home. He shared with us that when he went home, he was shocked because his family members all accepted him. And I asked him, I said, Russell, why do you think that is? Why would they accept you now and want relationship with you? And he said this, he thought of it and he said, they all like me because I've remained humble and honoring to them. He said, a lot of people from Bangladesh moved to America, and they become haughty and prideful and treat people back in Bangladesh as if they're above them. He said, but I continue to honor my family and just love on them. And when they hate me and they say horrible things about me, I send them a gift. <laughs> and I help them put their children in school. I've just been humble to them. And I asked Ross, and I said, wow, that's amazing. I said, what about your uncles who, tried to, who left you for dead? Did you see them? He smiled and Russell said, I saw my uncle. The one who tried to kill me before welcomed me and hugged me this time. What's the power of love? That's the power of love. His family is seeing the difference that Jesus made in his life. Russell doesn't have to be prideful because his security, who he is, is in Christ. He doesn't have to look down and build himself up because he is standing in Christ. Jesus' prayer, with this, this final prayer with his disciple, gives us much strength and hope for living. Will you serve Jesus perfectly after hearing this prayer? No. I'll comfort you, though. Neither did the disciples. Remember, only a few hours later they all denied Jesus. Remember? Jesus went to Gethsemane. They came to arrest him. Every disciple was gone. But Jesus did not deny his And he will not deny his you. He gave the promised Holy Spirit which empowered the disciples to complete the work God gave them. Now, we part of Christ's plan to show the love of Jesus to the world. You're it. Let's glorify the Lord by completing the task and goodness. Let's love the Father deeply like Jesus did. Let's love deeply those God's given us, our family, our co-workers. Let's love the world sacrificially for the sake of Jesus. Let's pray. Dear Lord, thank you for this time. Thank you for these people. Thank you for these choice servants, your saints, that you have redeemed and made holy and sanctified and set apart so that they may know you and through them others may know you. Lord, we pray for this church. I pray that your blessing on this fellowship of believers. I pray that you would give them unity. That would be powerful and would sign. I pray that you would give them unity that would win family members to Christ. I pray that you would give them unity that would make their children want to remain in Jesus and not flee the church once they grow up. Lord, we pray God, for your will be done here on earth as we pray in Christ's name.